Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to welcome you to this service of worship for the first Sunday of Lent at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you are here and worshiping with us today, and we'd love to be able to connect with you. So if you would, click the link that's in this video description or scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in just a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here and let us know how we can be praying for you. Now I invite you to take a big, deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me now in our opening prayer for Lent. The words will be on your screen. Let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, as we journey with you to Jerusalem, keep us close by your side. Give us strength to follow you wherever you lead, even to the cross. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor David, one of the associate pastors, and it's my joy to now be able to lead us in our congregational prayer. As I pray, I'll be pausing during the prayer to give you the opportunity to speak the names of individuals that you would like to especially remember in prayer today. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, be with us today as we find ourselves in the season of Lent and anticipate the coming of Easter. Help us to see Lent as a journey. And may you make this Lent a season where we find our way out of darkness and find our way back to you. Today we pray for our friends, family, and neighbors that grieve or face problems. We pray that they will keep their trust in you strong. Your promise is that you will stand with us when we hurt. Your promise is to heal our hearts when they break. Let us feel your presence again during this time of Lent. 
This morning we raise our celebrations and joys. Help us to see these moments as blessings from you. Help us to see the joy in every moment. This Lent, help us to find more opportunities to experience the joys you provide. We especially pray today for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We recognize that Lent is a time of temptation and personal struggle as we fight against the urges in our lives that threaten to steal the joy from our life. Help us to live lives through which you bless others. Through Jesus Christ we pray. And as he taught his disciples to pray, so now we also pray as God's confident children the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We believe that giving offerings to God is an act of worship, that we worship God through our giving. You may worship God with your giving through giving offerings at a live worship service or uh, through our church web page or our church cell phone app. And you can also send uh, offerings to God through the U.S. mail to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. We invite you to worship God with your giving. And now it's time for the children's message. So this is a great time to call the children and youth over to watch the video if they're not already watching it. Hey guys, I'm Pastor David and I've got something uh, special to share with you today. You know, a lot of times in life we face problems and challenges and we're just trying to figure out how in the world am I going to work that out? And sometimes it's really, really hard for us to figure it out. And aren't we glad that we have God to help us? Now, here's an example. Now, you see, I'm holding up a sheet of paper here. Who thinks, who thinks that I can pass through this sheet of paper? Uh, I see a lot of no... Oh. Thank you, thank you. I had one shaking their head yes, a lot of no's. Well, let's just see. Let's just see if it can be done. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is fold it over, all right? And then I have a pair of scissors. Now remember, I'm a professional. Don't try this at home. Okay, we're just going to make a cut like that. All right, and then we're going to cut over here. 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 Yeah, now stay with me. We're almost there. You're going to see a miracle. You're going to see me pass through this sheet of paper when I get finished. Just 
a little bit more. Okay. Oh, and we need to do one more cut just like this. Okay. Now, now how many think I can put myself through this piece of paper? Uh, you're not convinced yet. All right. Well, I'm going to make a couple of more cuts. And we'll be there in just one more cut. All right. You ready? I'm going to pass through that sheet of, of paper if I don't tear it up. Look at there. Now, how about that? I passed through the sheet of paper, didn't I? And... You know, like I said earlier, a lot of times we face problems and situations in life that we just don't really see how we're going to work it out. But you know what? We've got an extra resource, an extra helper, and that is our God. God says He's a very present help in time of trouble, and we can call on to Him in our hour of need, and He promises to help us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank You that you help us through all kinds of difficult and challenging situations in life. Help us not only to trust you, help us to ask you for your help and be ready for the help that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane and I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And today is the first Sunday in Lent and that means we're going to be starting a new sermon series. And that sermon series is called A Journey to Jerusalem. And we're going to follow Jesus and the disciples as they make their way from the area in the north of Israel around the Sea of Galilee down to the south to the city of Jerusalem. Of course, we know the story. We know that there is where Jesus will be betrayed, arrested, and crucified. So we're getting ready to go to the cross. And let's begin in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my brother. Excuse me, bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Lord, as we enter this season of Lent, I pray that we might draw closer to you. Lord, fill us with your spirit wherever we are. And Lord, help us to be the people you call us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was 12 years old, I wanted to go to two-week computer camp with my cousin, who was 14. Only at this camp, they had a week for 12 and 13-year-olds and a separate week for 14 and 15 year olds. So we talked to the camp and they let me go with my cousin to the week with 14 and 15 year olds. So understand as this story begins that I'm at least two years younger than everyone else at the camp. And when you go to camp when you're 12 years old and you know only one other person and everyone else is older than you, there's a very strong desire to fit in. 
At computer camp, we did not sit at the computer lab all day long. We were on the campus of Duke University, and they would give us time to use the tennis courts or play basketball at Cameron, I bet you can't do that nowadays, and go swimming at the indoor swimming pool every day. On some days at the pool, they would even let us jump off the high dive platforms like you see in Olympic diving competitions. I don't mean the three meter springboards. I'm talking about the 10 meter concrete cliffs that people dive off of way up in the air. So all my friends are jumping off. It looks really cool. They egg me on to try it. I want to do it, but I'm scared to death. Nevertheless, I started climbing the stairs that would take me three stories above the water. I look down. Uh, yeah. My knees are knocking. I am terrified. There is no way I'm jumping off this thing. Not going to happen. Everyone down below is cheering me on, my friends, the pretty girls I wish I could impress, basically the whole camp. I look over the side again. Nope, not today. No siree. And I start the embarrassing, agonizing climb back down the stairs. I felt so defeated, so embarrassed. And sure enough, my new friends, who incidentally I would never see again the rest of my life, let me have it when I came down. I was clearly not cool. Days pass. I'm feeling pretty low. I hang out on the three meter springboard when we go to the pool, which is no small thing, by the way. Thank you very much. And then we reach the 4th of July. On the 4th, all the instructors had the day off, so the counselors took us to King's Dominion Amusement Park north of Richmond. So much fun. Until, guess what? My friends wanted to ride the biggest, baddest roller coaster there. Now remember, this is 1983. I'm sure they have bigger and better coasters today. But back then, the fastest coaster was the Grizzly. We all got in line. Let me tell you something. There was no way I was going to tell my friends that I had never been on a roller coaster before. As I went through my teen teenage years, I successfully said no to alcohol, to cigarettes, to drugs, and what have you. But peer pressure got the best of me on July 4th, 1983. I wanted to chicken out so bad, but I just couldn't do it twice, not in the same week, not when they were the only people I would be hanging out with for the next two weeks. This time, I was committed. I had to do it. So, I strapped into that thing. My heart was pounding. I said a prayer, and we were off. Slowly at first. You know how it is, there's no turning back now. The only thing worse than standing in line for a roller coaster that you don't want to be on is that small climb up to the top, excuse me, slow climb up to the top of that roller You know how it goes, click, 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 click. Oh my gosh, I was so scared. Anyway, you know the feeling if you've ever been on a roller coaster. It's so frightening. And then you finally reach the top and you look out and I could swear I could see the Washington Monument up in D.C. We were so far, far up in the air. And then suddenly, swoosh, you're going faster than you have ever been in your life. The wind's blowing through your hair. You're going left. You're going right. You're going up. You're going down. It's amazing. It's pretty much the most exhilarating feeling you've ever had in your life. I loved it. And as soon as I got off the ride, I wanted to go back and do it again. Yes, the risk paid off. The commitment was worth it. Overcoming my fears and going all in made for an incredible experience and opened me up to a lifetime of thrill rides. But first, I had to muster up the courage. On a much more serious note, I've heard the same from expectant parents. That phrase, you're never ready, it's quite true. As the months go on and the time for the birth approaches, parents start to panic. What if I'm not a good parent? My entire life is about to change. Can I really pull this off? When the moment comes, it's too late to turn back. Once that baby's born, all little eyes melt those parents' hearts. 
All that fretting and worrying is soon forgotten with the little smiles and coos. You go forward and you commit to a lifetime of parenting along with all the responsibilities that go with it. And you do it gladly. Your life does change. But I don't know any parent who wouldn't say it wasn't worth it. Now that said, committing to the wrong things can get you into a lot of trouble. Sometimes you can be on the road to a very bad decision, realize your mistake, and turning back is actually the right thing to do. Unless you can't. Sometimes that happens. One of my favorite movies of all time is the original Jurassic Park. There's a great line in the movie where Jeff Goldblum's character turns to the creator of the dinosaur park and says, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they never stopped to think if they should. Because sometimes there's truly no turning back. And you've got to be committed not only to your decision, but to the responsibility that goes with it. All the outcomes, all the consequences. Today's scripture is about commitment. The commitment to discipleship, to following Jesus, with all the danger and responsibility and difficulties that go with it. Jesus has come to the time of reckoning in his ministry and he's on his way to Jerusalem. The road ahead is not going to be easy. Anyone going with him at this point will be committing to a very difficult life. And Jesus does not hide this fact. He very bluntly lets whoever wants to follow him know what life as a disciple is going to be like. Jesus is not into sugarcoating things. He doesn't say, ah, yeah, come along with me. You'll get a great salary, awesome benefits, lots of perks, excellent food, five-star hotels, and a gym membership. No. He says, life with me is like being perpetually on the run. You can't stop to rest. You'll be constantly watched and pursued. You might be in danger. Many will reject you and give you no place to sleep at night. We move from place to place. You must be entirely committed to this journey, so much so that you're going to spend most of your time away from your family and your friends. You'll need to give your time and your energy entirely to this mission. And then you're going to be rejected by nearly everybody. Sounds exciting. Sounds like a great job, right? I once passed a fire station that had a sign outside on the lawn that read something like this. Firefighters wanted hard labor, low pay, odd hours, cool ride. Well, while it's meant to be amusing, the sign speaks some truths, right? Ask a firefighter in any town and you'll find a community-loving volunteer who is proud to serve and who loves the camaraderie and satisfaction of saving homes and saving lives. Think of the healthcare workers, exhausted, who worked long hours in terrible conditions in the midst of a dangerous COVID shutdown. Think of the teachers who went back into the schools and taught both in person and online. It was so tough. But we commit to what means a great deal to us. When we're serious about what we want to do, we will find no excuse for not doing it. We leap into dangerous situations all the time. And when we're committed to the mission and purpose of what we're doing, there's no stopping us. We know this. No one commits to a semi-marriage. No one commits to partial parenting. No one commits to winning a race without practicing. No one commits to college and blows off their grades. Okay, well, wait a minute. That may not be the best example. What we care about, we will commit to. And what we truly commit to, we will go through anything to follow through. This is the challenge that Jesus is presenting to anyone wanting to follow him, especially during this vital time near the end of his ministry. How serious are you about doing this, he wonders. Jesus might have said, what does it take to come with me? Unconditional commitment. No halfway measures. No sort of disciples. You're either in or you're out. Look ahead, not behind. Once you come on the road with me, there's no turning back. Can you look ahead? Not back? Can you risk danger, rejection, and discouragement? Do you know what you're committing to? 
To them he said, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He's basically asking, is this how you want to live? Do you have that kind of commitment? Will you follow me through to the end? He told all who would listen that if they look back, they weren't fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Now, most people would jump at the chance for a few followers along the way, right? Jesus isn't that way. He's looking for people who's going to stick with him through to the end. What a juxtaposition. There are those whom Jesus called with a simple come, follow me. He doesn't lay out the requirements, just a willingness to follow. Others begged to follow, and he rejected their requests. The difference was that they had their own requirements and stipulations. If they were to have followed him, they wanted to do it their way, on their terms, on their time. What they didn't realize is this was God's kingdom, not theirs. They weren't in charge. Jesus was. They don't set the rules. God does. Things really haven't changed much in that regard in the last 2,000 years. Jesus still calls us to follow him. Those who hear the call begin to die to themselves and set their face toward Jerusalem. Others would like to follow without hearing that call. They don't last because they want to follow according to their own rubrics. That often means they'll follow him from a distance where things seem very safe and comfortable. They want to be close enough to receive the glow, but far enough away to avoid any problems. We most often look at Jesus as this kind, loving, gentle person, and he certainly was. But he's also tough as nails and blunt as he could be. He had to be. Jesus knew that true discipleship is not an afterthought or some fun excursion. It's definitely not a walk in the park. It's a serious occupation driven by mission and fraught with the unexpected. Today, too, this hasn't changed. Anyone looking at the state of the church today knows how much work it will take to continue to carry out the mission that Jesus intended to bring the gospel to the world around us. In our culture today, if you're truly a disciple of Jesus, truly committed to the mission of the gospel, you too are going to experience discouragement and rejection and dismissal or worse. For discipleship's not an easy road. It's a lifelong mission that's going to challenge you and it's going to change you. We all have these moments in our lives. We all have our doubts and our fears and our misgivings. In our days of weakness, we're reminded of the call to set our face toward Jerusalem, to remain resolute in the things of Christ. It's not easy being a disciple in the 21st century. Of course, it never has been easy. The early disciples were the first to discover this truth. As we grow in our Christian faith, we understand more and more that there are things we need to do as well as things we need to avoid. As our pilgrimage through this life winds through the villages and towns of our existence, we slowly gain confidence in the ability of Jesus to get us to the new Jerusalem. We ultimately learn that many legs of the journey are going to be hard, and there are going to be things we'd just rather avoid. Yes, we tackle these hardships, these uncomfortable interludes, because we've learned we're part of something much larger than ourselves. We're part of the body of Christ the kingdom of God. The distractions along the way are merely that. They're distractions. They're not the sum total of our lives. They're merely obstacles to be hurdled, to go around, or to just blast through. Despite them, it's on to Jerusalem. Discipleship with Jesus is a risk. No guarantees, no certainties, no real plan, honestly. All it requires for you is to let go of your own expectations and your past, and to forge into the future. Trusting upon Jesus to lead you into wild and woolly places, places where you've never been before. You ready to sign up? Go ahead. I dare you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, you've placed a call upon each and every one of us to follow your son, Jesus Christ, to use our gifts to build up your kingdom. Lord, 
Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it. He lets us know that it's going to be hard. Help us to stay close by his side. Protect us, provide for us, and give us courage to face the future unafraid. Lord, help us to follow in his footsteps, even when it gets tough. In the name of your Son, our Savior, amen. Jesus knows where he's going. He knows the outcome even before he sets out toward Jerusalem. And he reminds the disciples that this is hard work. It's a tough mission, but it's so worth it. It's going to take courage. It's going to take commitment in order to be a disciple. Know that God is with you and that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. But it's going to be hard. But he'll lift you up and he'll show you the way. Go forth in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may be.